Okay, I think we're ready. Uh, sorry for the delay, but I'm really pleased to have Morgan, who's come from just about across the country, right, to uh, tell us about his vision of the future, as well as some of the insights that he's had from uh, writing some very acclaimed episodes for Star Trek and other TV shows as well, and uh, other science fiction writing that he's done. So. I'm just going to give you a, an overview of our meetup for those who are new or maybe you've been here once or twice or for those who are, who are watching on live stream. We're the uh, largest futurist meetup in America and we're very close to becoming the largest one in the world by name. There, there are many others uh, that don't have that name, but it's um, grown pretty rapidly in the last two or three years. It just seems to be a pretty good interest. Um, so. We generally have our events at Brooklyn Law School in downtown Brooklyn. We're uh, working with live stream public and we're very pleased to, to have that opportunity. We're, as you know, there's gonna be uh, live streaming this around the world, uh, not just in America. Um, we've got a YouTube channel where you can probably watch the last seven or eight that we've done uh, in their entirety and you'll also be able to see that at the end of this as well. Uh, if you want to tweet about us, we're at uh, BK Futurist. Okay, uh, we've had some pretty good media coverage from local newspapers. Um, we have some members of the media here, which we're, we're pleased to see. Um, we're generally filmed by the Internet Society of New York, who then uh, places the um, full videos on our YouTube channel, so we want to thank them for that. And we um, are organized by me. Uh, I run Promenade Speakers Bureau. I book professional speakers for a living. So I work with companies and associations and colleges that have big events or sometimes small meetings, but they need a high visibility speaker. And that's the connection that I have to this group, plus uh, a basic interest in the future. Uh, what do we talk about? Anything that's in the long-term future. 10 years is a somewhat of a cutoff. It could be longer than that. It could be a little bit shorter, but we're, we're going beyond a year because that's usually the mindset of anyone who's in business or any sort of organization. We're trying to stretch and be a little speculative. Um, we have all kinds of people. We have uh, scientists, academics, uh, technical experts, business people, venture capitalists, oddballs, outliers, uh, Renaissance people, and we welcome the wall. And, and really, the more that they're willing to stretch intellectually, the more we enjoy it. Um, we're also putting together a network with other futurist meetups around the world. And the way this will affect you is that hopefully we'll be able to get some more content, we'll be able to get speakers, and just general ideas that have worked in other places, as well as sharing what we've done with them. We've gotten some very positive response from uh, meetups in uh, Berlin, Singapore, Bangalore, Australia. So there's a, a lot of interest in this topic around the world. We've actually met a couple of the organizers in the last couple of weeks when they've come to New York and it's, it's a really stimulating environment uh, experience to meet these people and share ideas. Okay, our next event after this is May 14th, technology transfer and Essentially, that's what happens with great ideas that don't get commercialized and why that is the case. And it's actually a very big problem, despite all the publicity that you see about technology startups and billion dollar IPOs and so forth. Um, uh, startups in this country are at a 30 or 40 year low, especially among uh, folks who are in their 20s, which is where you would hope to see a lot of that kind of activity. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Some of them are secular and some of them are regulatory and, and there are other ways that we'll be exploring that and we have a pretty good panel of people from business technology, law, uh, fund, uh, venture capital funding and, and we'll talk about what it takes to actually get a great idea and get it commercialized. Um, I'm giving a bit of a hint on DJ Spooky who is somebody I've actually seen uh, talk before. He's a really fascinating guy. We hope to have him in June. We're not sure but we're trying to work out dates with him. He's based in New York, um, has written a book called The Imaginary App, which is about apps, but more like about the philosophy of apps. Um, he is a, a musician, a composer. He works with all kinds of multimedia artists around the world. He's 
uh, into yoga, publishes a magazine that talks about the intersection of yoga, art, and I believe technology called Origin, and almost the perfect kind of presenter for, for this kind of group. So we hope we can have him as well. Uh, Lucas Handwerker, who's uh, one of these prodigies who uh, talks about hypnosis, but more about just the powers of the mind and, and how it's not used as much as people could. And we're hoping to have him in September as well. Okay, well, I'm not going to read all these meetups, but these are other groups that we found some affinity with. Maybe they've helped to co-promote co some of our events, or we've gone to their events, and we just recommend that, that you... Uh, take a, a gander at them when you get a chance. They're all based in New York, or at least most of them are. Uh, and, and I will give uh, Ellen a shot just to, to give a, a, an intro to her group, uh, the Volumetric Society. Um, we could always use help. I could use help getting sponsors, um, to get ideas for programming, to partner with other meetups, even the logistics of just getting these events together. So if you can and you're interested, and it doesn't have to be a complete commitment, but even every once in a while, just come up to me or write me. So I'm gonna introduce, oh, let's see. Should we do that first? Yeah, why don't we have Ellen and Moon give uh, an introduction of what they're doing. Hi, I'm Ellen Perlman, and I'm the director of the Volumetric Society of New York, and we often co-sponsor events um, with Mike and the Brooklyn Futurists, and we're running something uh, that has a deadline of May 3rd called Art -A Hack, in which we team technologists and artists to invent something new. We give them equipment such as the Oculus Rift, Leap Motion, um, brain sensors, uh, all these kinds of things. We bring them in-house in affiliation with ThoughtWorks and after one month of all-day workshops, which we help facilitate, we present both at live stream and at other venues um, who are our partners um, what we've invented and we're going to our second year of that. So if you're interested and if anyone's listening online and they're in the New York area, it's art-a-hack.io, um, and you can apply. The deadline is May 3rd, and I want to introduce Moon Rebus, who's one, the co-director of the Cyborg Foundation. Hi, well, I'm, I'm Moon Rivas. I'm from Barcelona. I'm the co-founder of the Cyborg Foundation along with Neil Harbison. And the Cyborg Foundation was founded basically with three aims. One is to help people to become cyborg, to defend the cyborg rights, and to promote cyborgism as an art movement, social movement. Because we believe that artists don't have to use technology as a tool anymore. They can incorporate it to the body in order to extend perceptions and extend their senses so they can perceive the world in a different and more deeper way. And we're excited because last week we got uh, the right visas to be able to live in America. So we're going to move the Sire Foundation to New York. And we're excited to meet people and to create new projects. So just invite you to collaborate with us if you're happy. And, and <laughs> you can go on their website, Cyborg Foundation. You can no, find it. It's not that good then now, but it will be. <laughs> OK, thanks. <laughs> We love to have those kinds of uh, collaborations. We've uh, had some really interesting events uh, that have taken place with the Volumetric Society. I'd highly recommend that you, you go to see their events. Uh, we're going to do some quick book giveaways, and then we'll start in uh, Morkin's pre presentation. So these are all books that I've received running my Speakers Bureau. Some of them are futuristic, and some of them are more just business-focused. Uh, and I'm going to pick these out, and whichever one you want, you come and take it. I'm supposed to close my eyes here. but uh, Laura Hens.
So you have a choice of Zero to One by Peter Thiel, The Road to Reinvention by Josh Linkner, Higher Unlearning, which is by a futurist named Jack Uldrich, and Fast Future about the Millennials. Okay. All right. Next person, closing my eyes, is Jeff Goodman, my helper. Bestseller by Peter Thiel. I think it was in a Wall Street Journal top ten list for pretty much from the start to even now. Um, okay. Another thing with a microphone. Kayla Littman, Flocabulary.com. Nobody wants to be reinvented. Okay. Aguz, did I get that right or is it yeah. Aguz? So you get Josh Linkner's book. Okay, so I'm going to give a little bit of a, an introduction to Morgan. And again, we're pleased to have somebody of his stature here and accomplishments. I'm going to also urge you to uh, visit him afterwards. He has on sale scripts from The Inner Light and also a graphic novel that he's written and he'll sign those for you as well as chat. Um, so, oh, and by the way, and I'll, I'll mention this at the end, he also has a writing seminar that takes place this Saturday in Dumbo, right, at 30 J Street. Uh, this is an intensive, more like a six-hour program. It's for anyone who wants to write science fiction for TV or an aspiring, aspiring author or even just a science fiction fan. Uh, Morgan has written or produced more than 200 episodes of primetime TV and is best known as the writer of Star Trek The Next Generation episode uh, called The Inner Light for which he won the Hugo Award which is I guess the highest award for science fiction, right? Uh, his other science fiction and, and comic credits include The Dresden Files, which he brought to TV as an executive producer, MTV Spider-Man, in which he served as a head writer and showrunner, and additional episodes of both The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. He's also received Emmy and Writers Guild nominations for his work on Law and Order. So he's really well-rounded, and, and I think that would lend itself to learning a lot if you go to his seminar on Saturday. He's currently adapting Ursula K. Le Guin's celebrated science fiction novel, The Telling, as a feature film. Has written the graphic novel, Helena, is it Helena or Helena, in partnership with Stan Lee, and recently completed the TV pilot script, Layers, for Roddenberry Entertainment, in partnership with Oscar winner producer, Che Carter, who was uh, connected with Argo, the movie. Uh, Morgan leads workshops, teaches and consults to TV production across companies, I should say, across the USA, Germany, and Russia. And um, I will give just an, a final pitch for his uh, professional seminar. That's this Saturday uh, at 30 John Street in Dumbo. If you look on our event site, you'll, you'll see a link to that. You'll have to uh, sign up for that separately. And it's a workshop where he'll uh, lead participants as they work in a realistic writer's room setting to create the concept for a new hypothetical science fiction series the fundamentals of setting, character, and action will be examined with an eye towards how they work together in a compelling screen story. This is open to working writers, aspiring amateurs, science fiction fans, or just those who want to voice their ideas. And again, if you go to our site, you'll see a code where you can save $20 off that event, and that code is SciFi20. And if you want to follow Morgan on Twitter, he's at Morgan Gindel. All right, Morgan. This is it. Thanks to Mike Taubleb and the Brooklyn Futurist Meetup. This is an exciting night for me. I'm looking forward to talking about a little bit of a vision for the future. But first, I want to say 
I don't know about the rest of you, I want to know more about cyborgism. Is this a movement? Are there cyborgists around? I, I'm really intrigued with that. A couple of things I want to say just very generally about the future. I foresee a future when there's not a thing called technical difficulties, and we do not let yet live in that time. Should I move this? How is, how's this? is this okay here? And so here's what's going to happen tonight. I'm showing a few clips that show kind of a vision of uh, what the future looked like in terms of the connectome. And, but we don't have audio here. We have audio streaming. So I don't want to talk over the audio stream. So what happens when the clips are going to play, I'm going to walk to that side of the stage and I'm going to act out all the parts on the video clips so you don't miss anything. So people in the audience here are, are in for a real treat. <clears throat> I am not a scientist, obviously, but I've had to spend a lot of time thinking about what the future holds in terms of technological advancements, especially as it relates to the connectome, which is the map of the wiring of the human brain. When I say I had to do this, what I mean is that over 20 years ago, I had a meeting at which I was to pitch a show called Star Trek The Next Generation. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I, that's, that's good. And, and I had to think about technology and what it might mean because I had to come in there with some kind of fresh idea. And this was difficult. I, I had the meeting. That was the first step, but I didn't have the idea. So desperate to think of something. So I'm standing in my toddler daughter's bedroom, the same toddler who's now getting her master's degree at George Washington University, so it's been a while. And I looked up in the sky, and this is what I saw. It was the Fuji blimp, which used to fly over Los Angeles, advertising a thing. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this film. <laughs> but with my overheated imagination and thinking of Star Trek, this is what I thought it said. I thought, in the future, this would like, speak directly to each individual. And this was the start of me thinking about the probe that those of you who have seen the episode The Inner Light know how fundamental that was to the story. An object that could beam thoughts and memories, permanent memories, directly into someone's mind. And really only years later, I don't think the word connectome existed then, but years later I realized what I had come up with for this episode was a device that could rewire the human connectome. So let's take a look a little at that and see how that started. And remember, I'm going to go over here and do the audio for you. Captain's log, stardate 45944.1. Following a magnetic wave survey of the Parvenium system, we have detected an object which we cannot immediately identify. Magnify. Mr. Data? It appears to be a probe of some kind, but there is no Starfleet record of this shape or design. Sir, I'm detecting a low-level nucleonic beam coming from the probe. Shields up. Stand by, phasers. The beam is scanning the shield's perimeter. Increase speed to... Captain. It's all right. Captain, I've got you. little bit of the inner light. How many of you remember seeing the inner light? So you realize that right from the get-go, something's up. His, his brain is being altered. He thinks he's on another planet where he is eventually learns he is married, he grows older, he has kids, he has grandkids, lives another 50 years, and then wakes up and realizes only 25 minutes have gone by on the Enterprise, and that time his brain was rewired, so he has permanent memories. Remember, when he wakes up, it's not like waking up from a dream. This all really happened to him. And in his case, in this other life that's embedded in his brain, in his mind, it's a life of hearth and home, the kind of life he didn't have as Captain Picard with a family and, as I said, kids and grandkids. 
So I think to a lot of the fans of this episode, that's what they like, is seeing their beloved Captain Picard in this different way. To me, though, what this episode really asks is, can a human distinguish between memories formed by the sensory experience of exterior stimuli, distinguish between that, and the false memories created by artificial manipulation of the connectome? That's the question that I was in effect asking. The connectome, like the human genome, is pretty similar across the species, but it's the differences, those small differences in each connectome that make us individuals. The pioneer in this area is named Sebastian Sung at Princeton University. He's in the forefront of mapping the connectome, which I think he estimates with current technology it would take 3,000 years, but I could be off there. But he's finding a way to speed that up. He says we are our connectome. Well, if we're our connectome, then who are we if we rewire the connectome? Are we individuals or do we become a more homogenized product? I think we've already seen what happens when a technology comes about that can actually change slightly what it means to be human and how, at first, the choices that technology offers would be limited. That's your brain on TV. So let's look at an example of a technology we're all familiar with that changes people in a certain way and kind of evens out some of our differences. Yes, that's right. You see a kind of similarity to all these ladies. <laughs> now do me a favor, don't tell Mickey Rourke I called him a lady because he'll come and beat me up. But he'll be happy I mentioned him. And do me another favor. Don't tell Nicole Kidman I used her in this example. Thank you. So I mean this seriously, though, to look at how you know, a technology can be used in a certain way that we think is beneficial, and yet we look at us as a species and say, is it kind of knocking off some of our differences? So just as plastic surgery has made people look vaguely similar, Will we one day face the same lack of individual personality features when we can change our connectome if a limited number of choices are available for the template for how to do that? So let's take a closer look at exactly what it would mean to rewire the connectome. How do you change someone's connectome? How do you change the existing map of the wiring of their brain? Well, I would suggest that there's a very easy way to do it, and I'm doing it right now. You are now firing off lots of random synapses, and some of them are sticking because they're going to a place, a cluster of neurons in your brain that is already familiar with human, speaker, Star Trek, sci-fi. And what's happened is that it, it's almost a Darwinian process that so many random synapses are firing. And the ones that stick are the ones, for example, if you saw a picture of me uh, five years ago on Facebook, and now I walked in today, you might not recognize me because that synapse had not been triggered again. Something happens to it. It, it loses its robustness. It, it withers. But now today, those same synapses are firing, and probably enough times by sitting here that tomorrow when somebody says to you, hey, how'd you like that talk last night? You might say it was good, you might say it was bad, but your connectome has been changed by whatever I'm saying. And if you say, I don't remember that talk at all, then either you have a problem with your neurons or I've done a really bad job. But you get the idea, the connectome is always changing by rewiring or reweighting the connections. And so to talk about what we mean by changing the connectome, we obviously mean more than what's happening in a normal sense of things. And I like to uh, liken this to time travel. We're all traveling through time right now at a speed of 60 seconds per minute. So this is happening without doing anything special. So what we really mean is how do you accelerate that rate? When we talk about time travel, we mean how can you change the vector of time travel or how can you change the speed of your time travel? With a connectome, that's already being done to a certain extent through the miracle of, as it always is, drugs. So what's happening in your brain, as I mentioned before, is the random firing of synapses. And what happens is uh, the neuron will spike, an electrical impulse goes up, the axon 
and eventually comes really close to a, 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 a nearby neuron. And at that point, the electrical stimulation triggers a chemical input, and a vesicle holding a neuroelectrical stimulation makes the leap to the dendrite of the next neuron so input. And a vesicle all holding a neuroelectrical stimulation chemical makes the leap to the dendrite of the next neuron so input. And a vesicle holding a neuroelectrical stimulation chemical makes the leap to the dendrite of the next neuron. They make the connection that a vesicle holding a neuroelectrical stimulation chemical makes the leap to the dendrite of the next neuron. Meanwhile, they make the connection that a vesicle holding a neuroelectrical stimulation chemical makes the leap to the dendrite of the next neuron. They make the connection that a vesicle holding a neuroelectrical stimulation chemical makes the leap to the dendrite of the next neuron. It gets reuptaken too quickly, so you've all heard of the phrase with a neurotransmitter called serotonin, serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And the most common one we know is Prozac. Prozac is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. What it's doing is inhibiting that neurotransmitter from being sucked back before the connection is made. But here's the interesting thing. That in itself is not changing the connectome. What happens is a week after a person starts taking Prozac, something changes in the brain and actually clusters of neurons nearby will rewire. So it's not actually uh, uh, fixing the chemical connection that's changing your brain. Something else happens. They don't know how it works. But that's an example of how we are changing the connectome currently at a different rate than would happen in a different style that would happen normally in the human body. But we're still not there. Obviously, we're talking in a, in, a, in a futuristic kind of way. We're talking about something other than what we're doing right now. And I'm going to assume I'm sort of on the same wavelength with everybody here when I say that futurism and science fiction are kind of like related cousins, that they all kind of extrapolate from where we are now to see what we might be in the future. So I want to go back to the science fiction realm to talk about how the connectome might change in a very, very efficient manner, remapping the human brain. And I'm going to go back to Star Trek, The Next Generation, to talk about this. And it's not the inner light. There's a technology that's existed on Star Trek that's been staring us in the face as a way to rewire the brain. Oh, that's an actual photo of a neuron. And this is how they were rewiring the brain on Star Trek. Now, from the original series, my understanding from talking to the tech people on Star Trek, in the original series, the transporter was an analog device. It was sort of creating some kind of waveform and a rift in space and moving an object from one place to another, sort of like via a tesseract, something like that. It was, a, it was analogous to the warp technology that allowed the whole ship to move faster than light. But when they got to the next generation, what I'm pretty sure happened was uh, when they started toying around with this thing, the holodeck, you guys remember the holodeck? The holodeck was not holography. Somewhere along the line, when they wanted to act out all these things and be in different cities, I said to the tech guys in Star Trek, how did you do this? They said, well, the holodeck was using the same technology as the transporter room. It was scanning something and then rebuilding an aggregate of molecules to create. So the holodeck was actually props and dummies that were created in the same technology as the transport room and they could move around. It seems really far-fetched to me and I think it opened up a big can of worms and I'm going to tell you why. But if you think of this as the method of transporting that they were scanning, then every time Captain Picard beamed down, they scanned his entire body, stored that scan, recreated it. So my problem with that is that once you're doing that, why do you need a ship at all? You can scan the whole crew, and this is what the ship, oh, that's them landing, yes. This is what the ship would look like. It could be a little bitty thing, and you have everybody scanned on it. And the other thing is, once you can do that, you know, I don't even know why they needed any medical facilities. If, if you broke your arm or anything, they could just rescan you. It opens up such a big can of worms. You could have multiple clones of people. So I'm just going to put that in the bin of far future. I'm glad Mike said we're on a 10-year 10, 10 outlook on this because I, I'm not sure that will ever happen. And I don't think they really thought about how much technologically they could do with that technology. But back a little down to earth, I want to look at some of the other examples from science fiction of the so-called theater of the mind, which is what the inner light was, where you live a whole life in your mind. And that's going to give us some clues as to how we might do that in real life 
technologically. So remember the part where I have to act things out? We're getting there right now. Hit it. Ready for Dreamland? Oh. I'll be asking you some questions, Doug, so we can fine tune the ego program. If you answer honestly, you'll enjoy yourself a whole lot more. Your sexual orientation. Hedro. So, how do you like your women? Blonde? Brunette? Redhead? Brunette. Slim. Athletic. Voluptuous. Athletic. Demure? Aggressive? Sleazy? Be honest? Sleazy. The, uh, the first thing we need you to do, Mr. Barish, is to go home and collect everything you own that has some association with Clementine. Anything. And we'll use these items to create a map of Clementine in your brain, okay? Comfortable? What we're doing here, Mr. Barish, is... Actually creating a map of your brain. Okay, let's get started. If we want to get this procedure underway tonight, we have some work to do. I want you to react to these objects, Mr. Barish, if you will. <laughs> There's a good story behind this. Um, you know, actually, Mr. Barish, I, I'll get a much better emotional readout if you uh, refrain from any sort of verbal uh, description of the items. Just please try to focus on the memories. Oh, sorry. Is it possible? Of course not. If you can steal an idea from someone's mind, why can't you plant one there instead? Three layers down, dreams are going to collapse. Brain function in the dream will be about 20 times normal. When you enter a dream within that dream, the effect is compounded. It's three dreams, that's 10 hours I'm times sorry. 20. Uh, math was never my strong subject. How, how much time is that? It's a week, the first level down. Six months, the second level down. And Third level. It's ten years. Brain function in the dream will be about 20 times normal. And when you enter a dream within that dream, the effect is compounded. It's three dreams, that's ten hours I'm times sorry. 20. Uh, Mass was never my strong subject. How, how much time is that? 20, 25 minutes. 25 minutes. Some examples of the remapping of the connectome in science fiction. Most of these involve some direct machine-to-brain contact, or more or less direct. There it is in Total Recall, 
There it is in Eternal Sunshine when actually changing his brain. There it is. I never knew what this is. They're doing intravenous. I don't know. They're sharing a needle. I, I just never knew what they were doing in this movie. Don't get me wrong. I love Inception. It's one of my favorite movies. I just can't figure out some of the stuff. So we're going to forget about that one. We're just going to use the two that are some kind of direct brain contact. All right. So now the question becomes, how might we stimulate or augment the connectome in real life? How could we change and improve the brain? Okay, well, you might think that one of the ways to do it is to create more neurons to make you smarter. And there's an interesting thing about that. There is a correlation between brain size and intelligence, but it's the opposite of what you think. Having a bigger brain isn't what makes you more intelligent. Being more intelligent makes your brain grow because you're creating, remember, you have all those Darwinian synapses, all this wiring, well, that all has some mass. Like I said, you know, a year from now, you might remember me. That's because that synapse has remained, and a cluster of neurons has remained very robust. The vesicles that hold the neurotransmitter have grown larger and held more neurotransmitter. The axons have grown longer because they're connecting to way more different neurons. That has mass. There's actually a limit imposed by the size of your skull to how big your total brain mass can grow. <clears throat> so just making your brain bigger isn't going to be the answer. But we've been looking at the brain on a micro scale. What happens if we look on a slightly more macro scale? And what I mean by that is looking at the whole brain and clusters of neurons and how they affect different behaviors and different kind of aspects of our functioning. In Eternal Sunshine, Jim Carrey wasn't creating new memories he was deleting the painful memories. And I think this is getting closer to what might exist, perhaps not in the 10-year frame, but in the near term. In research by Stephen Quartz, a professor of philosophy at Caltech, and Annette Asp, a political scientist, it was determined that looking and thinking about things that are cool sparked activity in the medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with daydreaming and ruminating. So with some microscopic targeting, either surgical or laser or combination or chemical, why not think that we can indeed delete certain memories? And let me be more specific. Other research has shown that when they do uh, functional uh, MRI on a brain while it's thinking, if the su subject thinks of a hammer, the brain actually lights up in the shape of a hammer, which suggests that maybe our memories are all just Polaroid snapshots being contained that way. So why not do exactly what they did in the internal, internal sunshine? I think we're not that far off from really being able to get wired in under a doctor's care, be able to see which neurons are stimulated as you think of a particular memory, and destroy those cells, achieve the spotless mind. So you might not learn Kung Fu, but you might forget under this kind of technology the time you sucked at karate as a seven-year-old and your dad humiliated you and that ruined your whole life. You might be able to delete those memories and it saves you years of psychotherapy just from one session like this. And if we look at like neuron clusters, perhaps a shopaholic could have his or her brain kind of mapped a certain way, have certain clusters deleted, and it solves that problem. Overeating, maybe suddenly you're desensitized and food doesn't smell or taste as good in certain centers. So I think in the near term, this is something we're going to see with connectome remapping, is looking at clusters that are excited in a certain way and being able to target and delete those clusters. Jacking and rewiring the brain with the knowledge of Kung Fu is probably not going to happen in the near term, to look at the other way, not deleting, but creating new memories. But we might be able to stimulate the proper areas of the brain, again through a combination of chemicals and electricity, to make neurons more susceptible to learning. As I said, you're creating these random synapses that then become more robust if they're stimulated. Well, why not use some kind of external artificial stimulation to make those synapses stronger, to, to target the part of a neuron that is going to grow a larger vesicle and hold more neurotransmitter and grow a a sturdier axon. So if we can do that while you're learning, I think it's reasonable to say that 
back to the Kung Fu example, you're having the learning center stimulated while you're watching a video on Kung Fu. Now, when you read a book, you don't remember everything in the book, but you might be able to do that if you're having the right part of your brain stimulated to create more lasting synapses and hardier neurons. So if you do that while you're studying Kung Fu, then we move it over to the part of your brain that controls motor activity. And now you take an actual Kung Fu lesson while it's being stimulated. In this way, it took Neo, if you had heard the audio, live stream people did, they said he was under for 10 hours. They said he's a machine. Look at how much he's learned in 10 hours. Well, maybe in 10 hours you can have your brain stimulated while you're studying a video on Kung Fu and then take some Kung Fu lessons and maybe in 10 hours you actually will know Kung Fu. So I think in the near term that's going to be a connectome enhancement that we might see. So faster learning, faster forgetting. When it comes to predicting the future, I like to refer to one of the first movies I ever saw in a drive-in as a toddler, and it was this, Forbidden Planet. And there's a reason I'm referring to this. Now, the funny thing is when I pulled this, this uh, shot, this screen grab, just today, I was trying to think why this had such a, an impact on me. This is Leslie Nielsen uh, cradling the head of an actor named Warren Stevens, who just had his, do you guys know Forbidden Planet? He had had his connectome so expanded that it killed him. It probably put too much pressure on his head or something. Whatever it is, he's dying here. And so I saw this as a toddler, and I, I think it's probably not a coincidence that at this very early age, I was seeing something that had to do with mind expansion through artificial means. That must have stuck with me. As a side note, I was too young to remember seeing Forbidden Planet, but I remember remembering seeing it because it was on a double feature with Creature from the Black Lagoon, and I don't remember being scared by that, but I remember being told by my older brothers how much I was screaming during Creature from the Black Lagoon. So that's how I remember that I actually saw Forbidden Planet. But here's why I'm showing the Forbidden Planet. So in Forbidden Planet, those of you who remember it, it's the civilization called the Krell who took all their knowledge and put it in this massive computer and you could draw on it. And when Walter Pigeon takes Leslie Nielsen to see this, it's like the space of... I want to get this right, of 20 football fields squared. That's 2.5 cubic miles of computer space to hold all the intelligence of the world. Look at this. There it is right there in my Windows phone. I mean, what I'm saying is you can't really predict the future because you don't know which things we're going to know that we're not thinking about now. So I always like to think of the forbidden planet. It's laughable today to think that it took 2.5 cubic miles to store all the knowledge of a civilization. Now we all walk around with it in our pocket, which is to say I'm not sure we really know how far we can go with a connectome. But extrapolating from what we do know, we already have this, right? Cortical control devices. You can buy that at Hammaker Schlemmer for $249 and just with your brain waves make this little drone go up and down and probably Amazon is training people to use it to deliver packages. And we also have, uh, also with cortical uh, control, they're using it now with 3D control for people with uh, prosthetic devices. Like you can learn to control your own leg and arm and pretty soon it's natural, like you're walking, you're con just that's what your mind does normally, but we're learning to do it artificially. So this technology already exists. So I'm going to suggest, and this is my summation about the near-term future, I'm gonna suggest four ways that I think we will be able to modify and augment the connectome artificially to certain, serve certain needs. And oddly enough, I think it's going to mimic the stages of legal marijuana use, no joke intended, because I think the first product is going to be medical. I think a deprogramming or desensitization tool used in concert with drugs in a doctor's office to control undesirable behaviors is on the horizon. And once this becomes acceptable, it will branch out. <clears throat> I'm going to pull what I call the Marco Rubio. Just, I just needed that. And the funny thing is we always think, 
as we do with drug legalization. I'm not getting into that, but I'm just using it as an analogy that how dangerous are these things going to be? And uh, it's interesting that in Brave New World, uh, Huxley posited a drug called Soma that would be injected to people and would replace their need for religion. And this was seen as a frightening thing. So I think at first things do see fright seem frightening, and yet uh, uh, behavior modifying drugs are now totally acceptable, which is why I think the first thing you'll see with connecto modification will be medical. The next thing, once it gets accepted for medical, you go to recreational. And this is just something I thought kind of suggested what you might be thinking of when you're on whatever form this connectome enhancer takes place in a recreational kind of way. Just like the Hammerker Schlemmer thing, boom, you can buy that. Who's to say you're not going to buy some version of a connectome modifier? I don't think it's 10 years, but I think it could be 20 years. Then, I think the next thing that happens is art. I always thought the end of 2001, A Space Odyssey, seemed like some kind of mind-altering trip, so that's what I'm using as an example. Maybe you can create this directly from your mind by hooking up your connectome. And lastly comes the good stuff. I think some kind of educational learning tool, modifying our own connectomes. I think it'll become commonplace in the home as a learning tool not to implant knowledge, but as a knowledge enhancer and a behavior improver, like we talked about earlier with the Kung Fu example. So if we ponder all the things on the horizon, manufacturing in our home via 3D printers, uh, creating energy as needed with uh, hydrogen fuel cells, both in our cars and in our garages, maybe we're all gonna go off the grid, worldwide ubiquity of data, and reliable digital information and communication. We're partway there already. It's not quite worldwide, but it's getting there very quickly. And potential longevity via implants and cryonics or convergence. I think the personal interaction with our own brains will be the most significant of all of these. We think of K through 12 plus college as sort of being the way to personal improvement and enhancement or some alternative now like learning online but what if we can have control of our own brain and control our behaviors, get rid of behaviors that we don't find as desirable, create new ones that are desirable, create stronger learning potential, smooth out some of the bumpy emotional terrain, and then maybe have the kind of mindfulness that, that uh, people who meditate can only dream about. I think this can all come about from connectome manipulation. So now to come full circle, I envisioned a further use for the nucleonic beam from the inner light. And this is a panel from the outer light, which is the sequel. So brief story about this. I pitched a sequel to the inner light a year after I wrote the inner light, and they didn't want to do it. But I thought the story needed to be told because Captain Picard needed some closure. His connectome had been changed, and then we left it changed, and then the next episode he's supposed to go on living like nothing happened. And that always bothered the fans. I know Ron Moore talked about this and uh, how they just didn't expect the impact it would have. So that's what the outer light is. You're looking at a panel there of a pocket nucleonic beam and how it's used um, in the sequel, almost as, not as a drug, but for people to seek solace from their cares and woes. So that's, that's in the far future, but maybe not as far as we think. And the only real problem I think we're going to face, we always think it's going to be the technology, is it some dangerous technology, is it some dangerous drug, and then you look back years later and it's kind of laughable that you thought these things were dangerous. I mean, we're thinking about driverless cars now, and even a few years ago, people probably thought, you gotta be kidding me. We're already saying, yeah, I want one. In a few more years, we're gonna say, I can't believe we ever lived without these. So I think the technology of connectome manipulation is going to follow that curve. The real problem is going to be sociological and political, because as always, Technology like this gravitates to the haves. It'll be one more way the people with money can improve their lives even more and distance themselves even more from the have-nots. 
And I think that's what we're going to have to deal with, with this kind of technology. But maybe just the enlightenment from the way we improve our own connectome will take care of that. Maybe we'll want to share this with everybody equally. So I'll leave that to people with bigger brains than mine to figure out. I have a couple more things I want to say, but thank you for listening. Thank you. So just as a note, I know um, Mike was kind enough to talk about this. I just wanted to talk about this again and tell you a little more what this is. What, what I do in this country and, and in Europe is kind of run either a real writer's room like they do on TV shows. I do that when I'm a showrunner and I do it when I'm a consultant. I just did it for a series in Moscow. But I also run what I call a mock writer's room for people who want to get the experience of that collaborative thing. Because the way we create te television in the States that stands out in the whole world is that we can mass produce it. We make a lot of crap too. We can mass produce the crap too. But we've, we've made a lot of good TV and what we can do that most countries don't know how to do is the consistency. So some of you are probably thinking, well, British shows are so good, but they still don't, they never knew how to make 22 in a row. I want to kind of not going to say never, but that's our state of the art. So what I'm doing on Saturday is running a writer's room. Everybody who comes, whether you want to be a writer or just are interested in writing or like sci-fi or just want to have a fun day with a group, it's called Create the Next Hypothetical Sci-Fi TV Series. And that's what we're going to do in the course of a day from 10.30 to 4.00 at the Made in New York Media Center. We're gonna function like writers and all work collaboratively and you'll see you'll all pitch in different ideas and I'm gonna kind of steer it, talk about, you'll learn also about how TV is written, talk about how the world and the characters and the plot all kind of interact and we'll create those things and by the end of the day, we're gonna have a pitch for a new sci-fi series. So that's gonna be a lot of fun if anybody wants to come. Just go to, oh yeah, where'd that go? I guess that's like, not allowed on screen. Don't touch it, get your cursor off of there. Uh, this is just to say that Star Trek and Star Wars alike are invited. We can all get along in one day. I love the way that looks though. Who's gonna win that staring contest? That should be an episode. Uh, but one of them has the force and one of them has photon torpedoes, so. So that's how you can find out where these things are. That's my website, morgangundelg.com. Go to there and you'll see a little Brooklyn thing and flip it around and it'll give you all the details for all these things. And thank you again. And I'm, when Mike says, I'm going to be over there uh, autographing uh, copies of the original draft of The Inner Light and copies of The Outer Light, the graphic novel sequel, and happy to talk to you more over there. Thank you. Do you have time for that? Let's do some Q&A. Yeah, I just think it's going to be too complicated and too expensive to hand one out to everybody. And if you're saying that in, in uh, China, they're going to force everybody to go through there like you go through the metal detector. I don't know. I, I, I think it's going to be too hard to do on un unwilling subjects. And I think we always kind of think that that goes in line with what I'm saying. We always fear these things are going to be used um, for evil. And I am predicting that that will not be the case. I think it's going to be too difficult and it's going to start with the elite to use for their own self-improvement. Yes. Yeah, it's sort of like what I'm talking about. I mean, that, that is what I'm talking about. I don't think it's to the extent that is actually going to, uh, what that is, is is immediate stimulation that affects you in the moment. But what I'm talking about is, is connectome remapping that can only be done 
with a combination of uh, neurotransmitter injection and electrical stimulation to create a permanence. I, I don't think that the transmedial stuff uh, creates a permanent change. I think it's, and they use it mostly, it can be used for fun, and they use it, I think, before they do br uh, brain operations. Now you're on to something. The, the military is probably, to, to answer this gentleman's question a little further, I would buy it more that it's going to be used for military use first. Yes? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I'm not a scientist, but from what I know about this in my own research about it, what happens is parts of the brain start talking to each other in ways they wouldn't. That's why I showed the diagram of the macro view of different parts of the brain controlling different behaviors. I think the, connecto, the, the, the brain is remapping a little bit because uh, neurons are connecting to a different part of the brain. They're cross-talking in ways they didn't, and that's helping in both the examples. That's helping them do things they couldn't do. That's... Yeah, but that, to me that falls in the category of what I said originally, though. I'm remapping your connectomes right now by talking to you. So they're doing activities that are helping shape their brain. So what I'm talking about is when they can go to a doctor's office and be zapped and have that done. That's, that's what I think is not that far off that will accomplish the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, yes. I think that's a good question if it were like in the matrix and you just jacked in and walked away with it. And that would really then be a problem, like I say, with haves versus have-nots, that rich people would just learn whatever they want to learn. And, but I think I was suggesting something a little different. I was suggesting more a, um, a stimulating of the neuron clusters that grow as you learn only having it happen faster. So it's a little different than having, you still have to work to do it. I don't think that, I mean, what you're saying then would apply if we say, oh, somebody can take private lessons. When I used to have to learn a horseback ride by roping a wild horse and taking five years to tame it, it's really not any different. I'm just talking about a learning, an educational tool. So I think it's a little different than having, I don't think I really saw that as a synthetic experience. So I was contrasting it with Keanu Reeves learned uh, Kung Fu in 10 hours just they were just rewiring his brain and I'm saying in the ten out same ten hours you stimulate parts of your brain that allow you to remember more when you're studying kung fu and to have your motor skills enhanced when you're practicing it so I think it's a good question uh, I don't think we're gonna think twice about that when when the technology I'm talking about happens Say it again. I'm aware of if you are, have heard of optogenetics. Uh, uh, only vaguely. Can you tell us about it? Okay. Optogenetics, which is um, being done now uh, in experiments in mice, has uh, recreated an implanted memory and computer response in mice through shining light and um, altering the genetic code. And it's been, it's been shown it works. And optogenetics is a new field. Uh, it's grown in popularity in the past few years, and it actually changes memory on the molecular level. 
by through the optic nerve. No, no. No. Oh. A genetically changed molecule within certain areas of not, not at this point in mouth growth. Oh, I see. So they're still uh, cutting open the skull and, and stimulating it, but not with electricity. They're using light to stimulate. No, they're not cutting open the skull. What they're doing is they're doing a change of molecular level in chemicals. Oh. I'm not aware of that. It sounds, it sounds like it's some of the same kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So Interesting. Because you're talking about it, I'm going, hmm, I wonder if he knows about optogenetics. It's a hidden field, but it's like hard science. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Sure. Yes? Some people have said in the future, with advances in robots, cyborgs, uh, manipulating atoms, that we, you know, with 3D printers and advancements, that we'll have a world of abundance. That's a little far afield from Connectome, but if you're asking me to speculate on the basis of sci-fi, let's think about it. I mean, I think, I think proliferation of uh, hydrogen fuel cells will give everybody more energy, especially in places that, uh, third world places that are off the grid, just like now cell phones are allowing people in third world countries to advance using micro banking. They can start businesses. Nobody thought that cell phone was gonna be the first thing they would want. I think uh, fuel cells will bring energy abundance to more people and the price will come down. I think those sort of things will happen. I don't know if it'll be just the haves versus have nots for the kind of stuff you're talking about. Replicators and stuff, I, I don't know because it's gonna take raw materials. I'm not sure how far we're going to go with home replicators. I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I think you probably had somebody talk about that, didn't you? Yeah, we've had some 3D printers. Yeah, and what have they extrapolated for the future? Right. Who was it? Was I talking to somebody here about replicating food? I was talking to somebody today about that. And uh, what I concluded was that you would have, uh, it would be either carbs or proteins. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I don't think you're going to like have a roast chicken come out of that thing because it's just something's going to be missing. But I think there will be some molecules that are somewhere between tofu and beef and chicken, and you can make that, and something that's more like dough, and you can make that, and then you'll still cook it, but you won't have to go shop all the raw materials, and you'll get like your protein patty. I, I think that's the first thing that's going to happen with food replication. Thank you. I'm going to move over there. Thanks again. <laughs>